One of my favorite verses in the scriptures is in the book of Ecclesiastes, which might be my favorite book in the scriptures. And it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10, because this is one of the places where Solomon becomes really practical. He starts talking to us about principles for life. And in this one verse, he drops on us some incredible frameworks for how to lean into our future and maximize our opportunities. 2018 is going to be the best year of your life, but it isn't something that's going to happen to you. It's going to be something that you make happen. You have to decide that this is going to be the best year of your life. Uh, for years, I would hear people talk about 2020 vision. I thought, well, you know, that's normal, right? That's what we're supposed to have. Wouldn't it be great if we could have 10-10 vision? Wouldn't it be great if we could not only see clearly in this moment, but see clearly into the future? So here it is. This is Proverbs chapter 10, verse 10. So we can have 10-10 vision. Because if the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed. But skill will bring success. Simple verse, straightforward. It's a way that we can make sure that we stay sharp. If the axe is dull and it's edge unsharpened, I remember when I went out cutting down trees in the mountains of Virginia, it's, it's hard work. There's nothing easy about being a lumberjack. It takes an intense amount of energy and strength, determination. And I don't know what great lumberjacks do, but I can tell you that my day was spent cutting down a tree. I should have taken a smaller tree. But it takes a long time to cut down a big tree. See, I think sometimes in our lives, we, we, we have a sense that we're supposed to be successful, but, but once you have faith, when you add the language of faith and the language of success, they almost become mutually exclusive, and we start treating it like magic. Or we start feeling badly about success because we feel like our faith should almost make us not want success, so we actually begin to take on structures of failure because we think success is somehow wrong. And I don't know if you know this, but the people in the scriptures who had the greatest success faced the greatest adversity. They had some of the most difficult circumstances in the world. In fact, if you looked at their life in just a snapshot, you would never predict success for them. Names of people that, that we become accustomed to, and we think of them in their, in their pinnacle moments, like Daniel or Joseph or Moses or Ruth or Esther. But these were not people who began a story where you thought success was going to happen. I mean, Joseph was a slave. And by the way, so was Daniel. Moses was an exile running because he was a murderer. Ruth lost her husband, was a widow, lost everything, lost her family, and returned as a refugee to a people that were not her own. Esther was the victim of essentially the sex trade taken as a concubine or a wife of a king who collected women like others collect horses. And this is the narrative that success comes from. See, I'm not always comfortable with the language of success because we, we don't want to pretend that success comes easily. But I think part of the problem sometimes is that we underestimate how much God wants to do in our lives. Now, I don't know where you're at, what you've been through, what kind of year you just came out of. I don't know the difficulties you're facing, the hardships that you're taking on, the challenges that may be overwhelming you. But I can tell you this, you're probably not in as bad of a situation as Babylonian captivity. So if you contrast it with the journey of Joseph or Daniel or Moses or Esther or Ruth, I think you might be able to step back and go, hey, if God could take their life and create something extraordinary, maybe God could do something with me. So you may feel like what you're facing is daunting and overwhelming. Or you may go, well, you know, God doesn't really guarantee success. No, he doesn't. He just offers it as an opportunity. And success is measured differently for every person. But just because success isn't a singular thing, you cannot define success for everyone. But just because you do not define success for everyone, it doesn't mean everyone cannot have success. So I want to challenge you at the beginning of 2018 and talk to you in a really pragmatic way about making this the most successful year of your life. 
but not hoping it happens, but making it happen. By stepping into your life with a level of ownership and responsibility that you're a lumberjack swinging at a tree, not hoping the tree will go down, but making sure that it does. But he gives us some basic insights. If the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed. But skill will bring success. So openly, opening question for me is like, what is your ax? Because we're not all lumberjacks, but we all are cutting away at something. There's something that has been placed in your hands right now. Something that God has entrusted to you that he wants you to accomplish. Something he wants you to take personal responsibility for in your life. So what's your ax? What is the thing that you need to get better and better at? What is the thing that you need to take responsibility for? What is the thing in your life that you need to take ownership of right now? And sometimes they play out in really concrete ways, like goals and objectives. Sometimes it's responsibilities. And, 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 it, and it doesn't even matter what domain you're in, what arena you're in, what your occupation is, what your vocation is, what your particular skills or talents. I do know this. There's something in your life that God has put into your hands and saying, this is your responsibility. This is your calling. This is your intention in life. And I think it can layer in many ways. Because I look at my life, I go, I have a lot of axes. In a sense, the, the ax that God has placed in my hand. I know that one of the axes I have in my hand is that I have a personal responsibility to be the best husband in the world to come. Yesterday was our 34-year wedding anniversary. We've been married 34 years now. And some days I've been a great husband, and some days I haven't been such a great husband. And I've been cutting away at being a husband for 34 years, but sometimes my ax has gotten dull. And I treated being married to her as if, as if it was something I should assume rather than something I should adore or cherish. And, and so I think for some of us right now, the acts we need to take on is I need to take on responsibility to be the best husband that my wife has ever imagined. I need to be the best wife my husband has ever dreamed of. See, because if you don't decide to be the best wife and the best husband for your partner, look what you've destined them to. They're married to you, and you've decided to be second best. See, I want Kim to never have to look anywhere else to find the best husband in the world because I'm the best husband in the world, and I keep raising the bar of what the best is. Yes, All right, come on. Some of you, you actually you take on how to be a better parent. I, I listen to a lot of people talk about their kids like as if they're a moral obligation. I hear people talk with more affection about their pets than I hear people talk about their children. <laughs> and I understand. But that child is a reflection of you. That dog is not. <laughs> and one of the axes that have been in my life is to be the best parent I can be. And I know I've messed up. I know I've made mistakes. I know I should have been better. I could have been better. But uh, I'm grateful that, that I took this on as a responsibility I wanted. I love being a dad. I love being the father to Aaron and Mariah. I love having invested in Patty's life and being her dad and replacing the father she didn't know. I have loved that role in my life. And it's always been an aspiration to be the best dad I could be. See, and, and what sometimes we don't realize is a part of the reason we're oftentimes not great parents is because, well, we're not great humans. Because parenting is just about having a relationship with someone powerless to choose the relationship or not. See, when we have relationships, if we're not good at relationships, if we don't invest in people, if we're not caring and compassionate, if we're not forgiving and investing, other people can cut bait. But your eight-year-old doesn't have a choice. They're going to be in a relationship with you and they have this longing for your affection, adoration, and love. And so a huge part of learning how to be a better human, taking that ax and saying, I'm going to be the best human I can be, is that it makes you the best father you can be, and the best mother you can be, and the best husband and the best wife. Yeah. And so aside from your career, aside from your outcome goals, maybe you should actually look at your life and going, I have an ax that's been given to me, I have relationships in my life, I have people that matter to me, and who I am will actually affect their lives, so I need to do this better. Yeah. Maybe you need to ask yourself, what, what, what has God put in your hands? What is your ax? You know, some of you are, are, are in transition. You have a job, but it's not your career. 
And, and, and the danger is to do your job poorly because you know it's not your career. And so you keep thinking, well, this is just the job I have. I keep waiting for my career. Have you been involved in the service industry with people who, well, it's not their career, it's just their job? But the problem is it's affecting your quality of life because they're treating it as if some, it's something that doesn't matter. What would happen if wherever we are, whatever we have in our hands, I never planned on being a lumberjack the rest of my life. But in that moment, I tried to be the best one I could be. And I didn't know I was going to be a carpenter and I was going to work construction. I didn't know I was going to be a librarian. But every single moment of my life where I had a different role, I tried to do that to the best of my ability. Because what you don't realize is that how you treat what you're in right now it may not have a direct relationship to where you're going, but it has a direct relationship to who you're becoming. And you're, who you're becoming has a direct relationship to where you're going. So if you don't do your job well, you're never going to do your career well. If you don't do what you don't love well right now, you're never going to do what you love well. You can applaud that because it's something we need to put into our hearts. And so without being too pragmatic, if you take a paycheck, that is a social contract to bring the best of yourself to work every single day. It is not a social contract to show up. It is a social contract to represent the integrity and quality of God through your work, wherever you are. So what is in your hand? What is the ax that God has given you right now in your life? And then for some of you, 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 you have careers, you have the role and opportunity that you've wanted all your life. And the question is, are you going to settle for where you're at, or are you going to aspire to more? I want to challenge you. I, I was in a conversation with um, a pastor across the world, and, and they've seen so many amazing things happen. And their resources are almost, it seems like, endless. Just millions and millions and tens of millions and maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. And I asked them, said, how in the world did you have so many people of wealth here? He goes, well, we only had one. He goes, we had one person of wealth, and we've been together all of our lives. And when they brought me that, when God brought that person, I thought, okay, I just need to go find the next hundred. And he goes, God just gave me one. And, and in fact, I started talking to the multimillionaire who was that one. He goes, yeah, he kept wanting to find more of me, but there was just one of me. As he said, he goes, I was his one. And he kept saying, we need to go find more of you. And he goes, no, 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 you need to go raise up more of me. So I'm going to believe something in this room. There's some of you here that right now, you can't see it, but you're going to be incredibly successful. I'm going to believe that some of you are going to do the hard work of actually developing yourself to the place where you become the best in the world. And you're going to become a source of resources for so much good in the world. And there's some of you here right now, and you already own your own, you, you, you're great at work, but you need to start a company. Some of you own your own company, and you need to grow that. And I think that you shouldn't treat success as a dirty word. Make greed a dirty word. Make success a good word. I, I got two. I want to convince you that God wants you to be successful. Not that he wants you to be greedy or opulent, but that he wants you to maximize your God-given capacity. I talked to UCLA graduates and USC graduates and the Berkeley graduates and some of the best schools in the world. And when I talked to students, I said, what are you going to do? And they go, well, you mean to pay the bills? Yeah, that's why your parents went into a quarter million dollars of debt so that you could be an educated, I pay the bills kind of guy. If you're in this room, you are in the cultural elite of people who have the greatest opportunity of any people in human history. You should never make paying the bills your bottom line. You should be creating so that others can benefit from your benefit. So what's your ax? It would be easy for us to say, you know, we're just going to focus on LA. We're sending Emerson and Christina to Mexico City. We need them here. They're some of the best people we've ever had. But for us to hold on to what gives us, God gives us and not share that with a world that desperately needs it more than us would be 
in irresponsibility to what God has entrusted us. What is your ax? What has God put in your hands? And, and then, of course, once you start figuring out what your ax is, you've got to figure out how big is your tree? Now, what is God trying to get you to cut down? You don't need an ax for twigs. But you, and you don't need a sharp ax if the tree is really, really thin, if you can just blow it over. But if you're going to take down a big tree, you're going to need a really, really sharp ax. And, and some of you, you need to step back and ask yourself, is the vision of my life big enough for the importance of my life? Am I taking on something that has been given to me by God, or am I taking on something so small that it just makes me feel like I'm big? This week, Kim told me that someone said to them, I just decided I want to be a big fish in a small pond rather than a small fish in a big pond. I just want to scream. You would rather be a big fish in a small pond. You're a guppy in a puddle. <laughs> and just because you're like maxing out the puddle, you're still a guppy. You're not a killer whale. You're just a guppy in a puddle. See, when you decide to be a big fish in a small pond, what you're actually saying is, God isn't big enough to do something big with my life in the real challenges in the real world. But you've got to be willing to be the small fish in the big ocean so that you can grow up and be a big fish in the big ocean. <laughs> So I go, how, how big is your tree? What, what are you trying to become? What are you trying to take down? What are you, what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to achieve with your life? And I, I, I feel like we almost have created a culture where it's, it feels unspiritual to talk about accomplishing something. It's unspiritual to actually have ambition. It's unspiritual to want to succeed. It's unspiritual to want to become great. I want to take down big trees. How about you? Now, you have no control over whether you're going to be the best in the world. You really don't. Because even if you optimize everything about you, ah, there's somebody in Iceland who's probably better. Right? You don't know. Somebody in Argentina who might be more gifted. See, you don't have to worry about whether you're the best in the world. What you need to focus on is being the best in your world. You need the best of who you are in the world and what you've been given. And, but I think it's okay to go, but I still want to be the best in the world. Because I'm going to be honest, I want to be the best in the world at something. I do. But not just anything. You have to pick something. You have to pick your tree. You have to decide what you're going to be good at. What you're going to give your life to. What's the tree you're going to cut out. You need to look at continuous repetition in your life. What are the things that God keeps bringing into your life over and over again that he keeps wanting you to take on? You know what I never have anyone ask me? How do you become a good writer? You know what I have a lot of people ask me? How do I get published? They don't see the connection. Everyone already assumes they're a great writer. They just haven't been discovered. See, instead of trying to figure out how to get published, you need to figure out how to become a great writer. I have a lot of people ask me, how can I get on stage and speak? Very few people ask me, how do I become a great communicator? So we say, hey, how can, how can I do that, rather than how did you get to that? So you have to ask yourself what the tree is. Did you know, I don't know if you know this, but I have to create like 50 to 100 new talks every year for you. <laughs> I don't even know some of you. <laughs> you know? You're not even going to say thank you. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> and you, you know what my goal is? I want to make this look easy. I want to make this look easy, but I can tell you how many times I made this look easy and people thought it was easy. God, it's so easy. People want to get up here without actually doing the hard work of being able to be up here and make it look like it's no work at all. But I, I was in my 20s and I was working with Urban Poor and I realized that these people never got the best of anything. So it was actually when I was working in, in an environment of impoverishment, where it was the worst food, the worst grocery stores, the worst service, the worst 
public services in the world, I thought, God, could you make me a great communicator? I'm going to do the hard work of being a great communicator because these people deserve something that's actually better than everyone else is getting. And so I didn't try to become a great communicator so that I would be known as a great communicator. I wanted to actually bring a gift to people who never got the best of anything. So yeah, I want to be the greatest communicator in the world. Why not? Why not aspire to? But I'm telling you, it's not easy. It's hard work. But you know what's funny? Sunday comes really fast. Shoo. Like, there I am again, Saturday night. Oh no, another talk. But I shouldn't be shocked because Sunday comes every week. And some of you think I only work on Sunday. But not only do I not only do I work all week long doing a lot of other things that steal the time to prepare for this moment, but a lot of times I'm speaking a lot of different things. And you're invited to the last minute to do all these different things, stepping into these different moments. I have to be in all these different environments with different kinds of people. And some of them who believe in God, some of them don't believe in God. And, you're, and you have to actually learn how to step into those environments and be able to speak into those moments to the people where they are. And that takes a lifetime of work. But it's continuous repetition. It's going, I'm going I'm to go at this tree. I'm going to keep working at this tree. And you have to have a lot of bad talks to have a good one. You have to write a lot of bad sentences to write a great book. And, and, but you have to decide, what's your tree? What are you trying to cut down? What are you trying to accomplish in your life? What are you trying to get done? What are you willing to do the hard work of? Because if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish, I promise you, you will not accomplish it. So how big is your tree? Because when you're cutting away, you know you're making progress in where you're supposed to be going. If the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, ah, that's interesting, and its edge unsharpened, that means it has to be sharpened. It doesn't sharpen by itself, which is always odd to me, because the way you sharpen an edge is through friction and heat. So I thought, why, why doesn't it just sharpen when you're cutting the tree? But that's the wrong kind of pressure against the edge, that dulls the edge. But you have to pull back and start sharpening the edge. And you have to ask yourself, with my particular ax and the tree I'm trying to cut, what does it mean to sharpen the edge? I want to ask you, how, how dull is your edge? Because you, you can know how dull your edge is, because it says here, when it's dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed. So you can know that your edge is dull because you're actually working harder to accomplish less. Wow. Here's the interesting thing. No matter how talented you are, if you don't attach that talent discipline, your edge will always be dull. Because the only thing that cuts the edge is the right kind of heat and friction. And that sharpens you. But a lot of us are afraid to get sharpened because we don't like the friction that presses against us. You know what the friction is? It's failure. I can tell you how dull your edge is by how much you failed or how little you failed. If you don't have any good failures under your belt, your edge is dull. I was asked recently what's one of the greatest challenges of this generation that called the millennial generation, and I said one of the problems is, of course, perfectionism. This is sociologically, psychologically, one of the assessments that's being made that we have a generation that has a, a huge uh, struggle with perfectionism. And, and, and it's because so much of our identity is based on facade, on how other people perceive us. And so then we perceive ourselves improperly. Because the only way you could ever have an internal narrative of perfectionism is to not see yourself clearly, because you're not perfect. See, I, I know this because I know me, and I know you. You're not perfect. And, and your great fear is that other people would know that, except they already know that. <laughs> and, 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 and so what happens is that perfectionism creates paralysis. Perfectionism creates paralysis because if you fail, it destroys your illusion of perfection. See, the only way you can protect the illusion of perfection is to do nothing. So, good. so you have to keep doing nothing. 
to keep showing how perfect you are. Wouldn't it be great if you could be great from the first step? Wouldn't it be awesome? It would be just so much easier if whatever God created you to do, you were just awesome from day one. Boom, I'm here. I got this thing down. But even if you were born to be great at something, you start like everyone else, bad at it. You have to work at getting better. And here he's saying, look, unless the edge is sharpened, you'll need more strength. So here's the way it works. Even if you're created to be great at something, it's gonna take a lot of strength, a lot of work up front. It's just gonna be hard. Man, I, I'm kind of grateful that technology has progressed during my lifetime. Because when, when I began speaking, it was um, eight track tapes. So we don't have any records. Then cassettes, we had some of those. Right, we, we had cassette tapes, oh, but we didn't have any real video. Now everything is documented. Everything's on video, everything's on film, you can record everything on your phone. It's amazing. Now everyone sees how bad you are <laughs> from the very beginning. See, most of my worst talks are hidden in the memories of people still damaged by my talks. <laughs> but they only have a vague memory because they're all too old now to talk about it. <laughs> but I, I, I kind of wish I had those talks just to be able to show those people here who are at the early stages going, this is what it was like. This is how bad it was. But when we got better, we just kept getting better and getting better. See, I, I, I think that one of the great dilemmas is that, and I think this is one of the great dark sides of social media is that you guys don't have the grace to be bad at things. People just don't give you the grace to fail, to struggle. Every time you mess up, it goes viral. Your worst moments are what people want to capture. And they want to define you by them. See, I, 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 I think we need to have create an environment where people can be bad and be safe. And I want a place where people are learning how to sing and people learning how to speak. And come on, have you heard people ramble on and on here during the announcements? Can't you get that announcement? <laughs> right. right. You know what? If you want everything here to be perfect, you don't get where we're going. Yeah. Wow. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get worse up here so we can all get better. Because we want to create a place where people can fail and struggle and be imperfect and they can learn and we cheer them on because they're giving it their best. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've been a little run down, a bit, a bit a little sick and, uh, and, and so Kim, you know, you got all nervous and worried and had one of our doctor friends come over to the house because I wouldn't go to the doctor and kind of frustrating, you know, and now I'm like over-medicated. I feel like I'm about to just collapse from all the vitamins in me. And, but uh, uh, she wouldn't let me, I was going to go play basketball uh, on Friday because I, I, you know, I asked the doctor on Thursday, so this is mean I can play ball tomorrow and Kim got a little angry. So she didn't let me play basketball, but she did let me do housework all day. And... <laughs> And I realized, oh, okay, this is how it works. You, if you're sick, you can't play basketball, but you can work on the house all day. And it's all good, because that's part of the healing process. And uh, <laughs> I'm not bitter. I'm just saying I've learned there's a, a divide and, uh, or a hypocrisy that's involved and, uh, in that. And uh, um, I can't even remember what I'm talking about now. <laughs> but, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, no, I really can't. And... Uh, <laughs> Oh, wow. And uh, how dull is your edge? It's really dull right now, God. And uh, <laughs> all right, so, I was, so I was really sick. And then <laughs> and my wife. And who knows? That was going to be such a great point. And uh, wow, look at that. Find your edge. Is that, the, is that the title of my talk? Wow. Man, I thought it was staying sharp. You should find your edge. You should. That's like, I agree with that. 
And uh, 100%, 100%. And uh, anybody remember what I was talking about? What was I talking about, Joe? Holes in the wall. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. That works. See, so while we were working on the house, see, it's coming back to me. And, uh, and But this is like the perfect point. Because you see, to, do you realize that I talk to you every week completely from an improvisational format, format that I, I, I'm not like, I'm not writing this whole thing out. It's all kind of like in a spontaneous flow of energy and insight. And you have moments like this, I'm, I'm, you know, where you black out and, and, and uh, you have no idea what you're talking about in front of people and uh, being podcast around the world. Good to see you guys. Go Berlin! And uh, so uh, Aaron moved out to Venice Beach about a month ago. So I, I, I heard Kim say something, oh, we should put a bed in there in case we have guests. And I said, no, I, I want that as my office. So I took it over really fast. And, and, uh, and then I started turning it into an office space, and then she started helping me and buying me some stuff. It was so cool. And, and we were driving last night, and I said, hey, honey, I, do you know anyone who does construction? You know, like, they can fix holes and maybe paint, you know? She goes, that room doesn't need construction. There are no holes, and it doesn't need painting. I said, well, do you know anyone who, like, you know, can fix holes and, and, and paint? She goes, it doesn't need that. Well, see, there's some things I'm not really good at, and I've been like putting things up on the wall. And then like, I don't know if you notice, sometimes you like could put like a nail and, and then the nail doesn't stay. You put a bigger nail and then you get, it's like, like you start getting like a hole, you know? And, and then like the concrete starts falling apart and, and, and then the things you're putting up start like falling and scratching the, the walls. And, and, and then the next thing you know, like hammers are going where they shouldn't go. And, and, and like, she's technically right. We didn't have any holes, and we didn't need painting, but I've been in that room. I was there all day Friday, and now we have holes and, uh, and need painting. And so I, I've been putting up, so I went and found like photographs and posters, putting them over the new windows and, uh, you know, the new, the new abstracts, and so that she couldn't see the damage. In fact, she came in the room, she goes, that doesn't look good there. I said, it's perfect. <laughs> It's exactly where I want it. And because uh, you, you know what I've discovered is that I need more strength to do things I'm bad at. It just takes me forever to do what other people are good at because I'm not good at it. And one of the ways you can know that you're in your intention is that you're actually getting better at what you do the more you do it. If it's taking more and more strength, you're just not really created to do that. It's hard work up front, but if you do the hard work, eventually you move into a rhythm where it feels easy. And it just comes to you. Whenever I start a book, it's so hard. And I begin that book with so much insecurity and self-doubt and self-loathing. I'm like, I'll never be able to write another book. I don't even know how I ever wrote a book. I don't have one more sentence. I have no more ideas. I'm never going to have enough material. And just fighting through it, you go, oh, I got a sentence. This is like a beautiful sentence. I, I, I start like adoring sentences because it's all I got. And uh, you know, let me share with you my next sentence. And, and it's hard work. And, and when you get to the end, you can't believe you've, you've put together all these sentences have created a work that people are moved by. But it's never easy. But what's amazing is that when, you, when, you, when you're in like your skill set, when you're in that, that place of intention, your hard work actually makes it easier and easier and easier for you because you've worked so hard up front. But at the same time, if, if it's really hard always, you're probably doing the wrong thing. The other day, Mariah was sharing at Venice and I think the only reason she shared was just to be able to mock me. And because uh, she got there and did the offering, she goes, you know, I, I'm not the first McManus who was a worship leader at Mosaic. My dad used to be the worship leader at Mosaic, which is actually true. And I don't know if I'd call myself a worship leader, uh, but I was a leader standing up here during worship. And, uh, and I, you know, played the guitar and sang. And she goes, yeah, my dad was the first one who wrote all the songs and he had the first album, which no longer exists. It has been destroyed for the sake of all humanity. And, uh, and, and she started saying, you know, my dad used to be the worship leader, but then my dad realized he should be communicating instead. 
And uh, <laughs> thank you, love. And, but it's true. Like, Kim would say to me, honey, I know you love music, but you know. Because <laughs> when, when, when you sing, people expect you to be as good as when you speak. And I say, well, what, what are you saying? What are you saying? Like, you, you know? And, and, and it's true because, see, I, I, you have to embrace some things and go, I love this, but this is not what I'm created to do. I can enjoy this. I mean, I'm still waiting for the warriors to pick me up. And uh, it's getting late. It's getting late. But um, I'm still hoping. I mean, they picked up Nick Young. They could pick me up. And, uh, and I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. But, um, but you, you know, there are things in my life I've had to let go of because they took too much strength because I didn't have the skill or the talent. But then there are other things I started doing and realized, wow, this is my sweet pot. This comes naturally. Are you asking yourself, God, what am I created to do? What is that that takes less strength because I'm developing an edge that's making me focused? More strength is needed. Uh, but then he says, but skill will bring success. I love that. See, why, my hope for you this year is that you'll stop wasting your strength. That you'll stop wasting your energy doing the wrong things. That e even if it's in your arena, that you'd stop seeking the right things for, for the wrong reasons. Like, if you want to be an artist, be an artist, but stop seeking fame. You know, if you want to be an entrepreneur, then, then create wealth, but, but stop pursuing greed. Like, make sure that you're doing things for the right reasons so that you're getting the right skills to move you forward and so that you're gaining strength from what you do. You know what I've discovered in my life? Whenever you're doing things just for you and for your personal benefit, it ends up sucking your soul away. But when you're doing it for others, there's a strength that comes to you. It's unexpected. So I, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna pray and believe that some of you here, you're going to do the hard work of creating multi-million, multi-billion dollar companies. Not because you need more money, because you need more wealth, or because you need it, but because the world needs you to do what only you can do. And because the church needs you to be a part of the fuel to create the future God has. But this last phrase is so important. But skill will bring more success. Another translation says, wisdom has the advantage of giving success. You ever heard that phrase, work smarter, not harder? I was thinking about that. I thought, it's almost right. Because it's not like an opposite. It's not like work smarter, not harder. Because I've discovered that anything worth doing is worth doing hard. See, I work hard. People ask, what's the secret? You know, a lot of it is I just work harder than other people. I just got up before other people, went to bed after other people, worked more days than other people, worked more hours. I mean, I like to say it was like an act of genius or a miracle or magic. Some of it was, I just worked really hard. I just cared more than other people. See, some of you, the only reason you're not accomplishing the things God has for you, you just don't care enough. You're just not willing to pay the price. You just, you just want to sleep more than you want to work. Or you want to watch TV more than you want to accomplish something. So I just want to throw this out there. Maybe we just need to work harder. But you also need to be smarter. Because if you're doing, if you're working hard but not being smart, you're just wasting your strength. So I don't want to say be smarter not harder. I want to say be smarter at working harder. It's it's a combination. Because if you're just being smarter, not harder, it's like, I'm just so smart. I can see what everyone should be doing. I'm not going to do it because I'm not going to work harder. That would be beneath me. I'm just going to be smarter. And some of you are going to be smart right into poverty. Because people who work hard and work smart are the ones who achieve success. So work harder at being smarter and work smarter at working harder. Get wisdom. It says, but skills bring success. But wisdom helps you accomplish what has been entrusted to you. What are the skills you need to learn right now? What, what, is the wisdom you need to learn right now. You, you, know, you know one of my frustrations sometimes? 
Sharpening the ax means I can't be cutting the tree. You cannot do both at the same time. And you ever just feel like you just, you're just so far behind everybody else? You're running out of time. You're already 28. You've lost your life. You just, you don't have any time left. You're about to die. You only have till you're 32. And if you don't make it then, it's over. I remember when Mariah was 18 and she said, I'm a has-been. And I'm like, <laughs> some of you have such a delusional sense of yourself. Do you realize that in my early 50s, I set goals for myself for when I'm 70. 72, technically. Because there are certain things I want to be great at that I'm just okay at right now. And so I told myself, okay, I'm going to give myself the grace of time. I'm going to give myself 25 years so that when my 70s, I'm going to be one of the best at that. Some of you just need to keep working at it, but you have to take time to stop chopping, to step back and start refining. What are the skills you need to take on right now so that you can become more successful? Do you need to step back and learn so that you can lead? Do you want to learn how to communicate? Start listening. You want to learn how to lead? Start following. If you want to learn how to succeed, you need to start humbling yourself and fail. Because the only way you will ever expand your future is to go deeper. You cannot go higher without going deeper. And there's some of you right now, you just need to start taking on some good failures. You need to start taking on some risks. You need to start taking on some new adventures and new endeavors in your life. Man, 2018 will be the best year of your life, but it's up to you. The ax is in your hand. The tree is right in front of you. You have the opportunity of cutting it down and watching God grow in you the strength to create a different kind of tomorrow. But you have to decide that you want it, that you are going to do it. So I can't wait. I'm so excited. This is going to be the greatest year of our life. We're going to see God do such great things. Some of you are going to just absolutely be astonished at what God is going to do through you. There's some of you right now, no one can see it, but it's in your soul. And I believe in you. I know that God has placed greatness in you, but it comes with hard work. So sharpen your sword, sharpen your ax, sharpen your character. Sharpen your skills. Get what you need. And by the way, you know, I was listening to the announcement at Mosaic College. I know today's talk is like a potpourri of different thoughts. But, you know, we started Mosaic College so that we could start sharpening the edge so that men and women could lead with greater power and effectiveness. And I think I'm so inspired. I, I, I think I'm going to teach a class this semester, Joe. And... Uh, I, th I think I'm going to teach a class on communication and, uh, but, um, or maybe leadership or maybe thinking. And uh, I, I think that my class is not going to have a title. I, I, I think I want the class of the people who are going to take the ask and say, I want to make the biggest difference in the world and I'm willing to pay the price for it. And we'll figure out what we do. And I'm a busy guy, so to add this to my schedule is not easy. But I just think that the future leaders of the world are in this room. And there's some of you here, you have so much influence and it's time to use that influence for the kingdom. There's some of you here, you own your companies and it's time to take your company and use it as a platform for the kingdom of God. There's some of you here, it's time for you to partner up and say, let's do this thing together. And everyone in this room, everyone in this room can have the most successful year of your life. It's on you, it's up to you. This is your moment, what are you gonna do? Hey, would you guys, so just thank God for this, all right? So good. So you may be here, and you came to church today, and you thought you were going to hear about heaven, you know, or something else that was not so relevant to your life. But I want you to know, Jesus Christ, God himself, stepped into human history 2,000 years ago, died on the cross, and rose from the dead so that you could live the life you're created to live. 
He didn't die on the cross just to take care of you after you die on this earth. He came to put into you the life you were created to live right now. And it's the scriptures that Jesus entrusted us with that says, and this will bring you success. So if God is saying, I want to bring you success, I think you can trust that. But the first step for some of you is crossing the line of faith and giving your life to Jesus. Because you cannot receive the life God has for you without God in your life. So right now, I want to invite you, if you're here and you're ready to make this the first step of 2018, to cross the line of faith and say, Jesus, I give you my life. Here's the greatest exchange you'll ever make. You give Jesus your life, he will give you his life. I'm telling you, it's an unfair exchange. Right now, Jesus wants to give you his life. He wants to give you life. He wants to give you new life, a new future, a new heart, a new you. So I just want everyone just to bow your heads for a moment, just close your eyes. If you're here and you're tired of doing this alone and you're ready to do this with Jesus, you're ready to let him create in you a new heart, to create in you a new future, a new life. I want you to pray this simple prayer right now. Jesus, I give you my life. That's it. Jesus, I give you my life. Right now, just pray that prayer. It's the beginning of a conversation you and God will have that will last forever. Jesus, I give you my life. Right now, just pray that. Just declare it in your heart. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. If that's you, if you're beginning this year, crossing the line of faith, giving your life to Jesus, if that's how you're starting this new year, if this is how it's going to begin the best year of your life, if you just whispered that prayer, Jesus, I give you my life. I want you to hold your hand up high right now. I want to pray for you. Beautiful. Wait, wait to not hesitate. Wonderful. All over the room. Anyone else right now? Jesus, I give you my life. Right now, just hold it up high. Don't be embarrassed. This is your moment. I want to pray for you. Jesus, I give you my life. Wonderful. Father, I pray for those in this moment have crossed the line of faith, have just declared to you, Jesus, I give you my life. I pray that right now they would know that you have given them your life. I pray that right now they would know that you have come to dwell in them, that they belong to you, that you will never leave them or forsake them, that you would wrap them up right now with your love and your presence. And God, I pray that 2018 would be the best year of their life that it would be the new year, the new beginning, the new heart, the new dream, the new future, the new freedom. I thank you, Father, for everyone else in this room as well, that they would step into a new future. May you take all that they've learned in the past and simply turn it into the material to create a more beautiful, astonishing, brilliant future. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus, and we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful message, Pastor Irwin. And if you're one of the people that made that decision to, to cross the line of faith, to follow Jesus with your life, we have one step for you to take, and that is simply to text the word DECIDED to 71711. Text that word and then somebody from our team is going to reach out to you because we are so excited that you've made this decision, but we want to make sure that you don't make it alone, mm -hmm. that you know that we are with you, that not only are you following Jesus, but you are also joining his family, you're joining his community. Mm -hmm. So just text DECIDED to 71711. We love you, Mosaic. It was so good to see you at church. We'll see you next week for week two of The Best Of with Erwin McManus. Have a great day. Love you.